When a review request for a product with drunk in the name comes across my desk, you know I've got to take a look at it. Today's video is brought to you by NordPass. If you own your own business, there's a good chance you're doing password management wrong. A sticky note under the keyboard used to be acceptable, but so was keeping a spare key under your welcome mat. Whether it's banking, procurement, web management, or simple business operations, NordPass makes managing online passwords a breeze with their easy-to-use desktop and mobile applications. It allows your organization to store all of your company's passwords in one location and distribute access to employees. Thanks to NordPass's zero-knowledge architecture, your passwords are encrypted before they ever reach their servers. Visit nordpass.com slash craftbusiness where you can get a free three-month trial at registration. Again, that's nordpass.com slash craftbusiness with code craftbusiness and get started today. And again, a huge thanks to NordPass for sponsoring today's video. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. Now, as a review channel, I'm no stranger to a whole bunch of odd requests for reviews that come across my desk. And this one definitely caught my eye, not just because of the name, no. So this is the M75 series Drunk Deer Mechanical Keyboard. So why besides the name would I be reviewing this? Well, it has a feature that I have never heard of being included in a keyboard before. So this is the Drunk Deer A75, a mechanical keyboard with Hall Effect switches. That's right, instead of using your traditional mechanical switch with a physical contact, uh, this is using Hall Effect sensors, uh, the same thing that we're starting to see in a lot of higher end joysticks to actually initiate the key press. Uh, it's a very novel concept and uh, something that I have not heard of being used in a keyboard before. Now, according to Drunk Deer, this Hall Effect sensor was developed 100% in-house and has lower latency and faster response time than any other keyboard, sensor, or switch in the world. I don't know about that because they all seem to claim that on whatever new keyboard that comes out. But I will say, first impressions, this is not a bad built keyboard. Um, I do kind of like the look of it. I like the overall feel of it. It's got a little bit of flexibility there, but really no deck flex at all to speak of. And I will say for a linear switch, that is a very satisfying sound. The space bar has a real, real light, but precise kind of springiness to it. Um, and it's stabilized very well. Uh, there's no, there's no angle deflection on it, no matter where you press the bar at. It, it drops evenly across the whole thing. Enter and shift are both the same way. So overall, a pretty decent quality keyboard. Now, just like the name implies, this is using a 75% layout. So essentially a 10 keyless, but in the addition of the uh, home page up and page down style buttons. I also like the isolation of the arrow keys over here versus traditional 75 key layouts, which kind of just cram everything into one grid. This makes it a little easier to on the fly, find the keys that you're looking for. We got a nice tactile roller over here for the volume adjust and it clicks down, I'm assuming for mute function. But uh, I do prefer rollers than function keys on my keyboards for media keys. So this is a, a real nice thing to see on here. Now out of the box, this is set up to be a Mac style keyboard. So it has command and option keys right down here at the bottom. However, in the bag, they also include windows and alt keys. So you can set this up in a PC traditional format. We turned on the RGB and uh, really nice effect through those keycaps. It's a nice translucency through the keys. However, I will say um, the default rainbow wave effect like this, if this is your style, it's not centered on the keyboard. It's in fact over here. And so the center of your pinwheel is not the center of the keyboard. I don't know if they probably use the same PCB or, or LED layout as they do on their full 105 key, but it's a little bit of an odd look. I don't know that I like that one. Yeah, that's a little much. I, I've, I've never seen that wave before. We're gonna have to put an epilepsy warning on this video. 
far be it for me to judge anyone's personal preferences on lighting or keyboards or anything like that. But some of these are just so, so busy. I, I can't, I can't imagine, even with the keyboard that I have now, which is, you know, fairly RGB heavy, uh, it's almost too much. <laughs> uh, I wonder if, hold on. Okay, cool. Some keyboards, if they have a reactive uh, RGB, if you start another RGB sequence at the same time, it'll cancel the previous one out. So if you have a reactive wave, the first wave will make it to here, but if I press a key, a key on the other side, that wave just stops and it'll cascade across the other way. This one seems to have no problem continuing one pattern onto the other. So that is a good sign. It's a good quality RGB controller. The flicker trail. Why? As someone who loves RGB effects, why? Why is this one a thing? So I did find out you can only, if there's 20 effects on this keyboard, you start at number one by default and you cycle your way through the effects by holding down the function two key and then hitting your arrow key. Normally when you get to the end of the effects, it would loop around and take you from number 20 back to number one. This one doesn't do that. This one will only go to number 20 and then you're stuck at 20 no matter how many times you press that key. You have to cycle your way back through, back to number one, and now I'm stuck at number one and I can't go further left, so that's weird. I am very vocal in not being a fan of linear switches. I really do prefer a little bit of a tactile bump when I'm typing. And I'm a fairly heavy-handed typist, as you probably just heard. But this is actually a very comfortable keyboard to use. Uh, the angle is just about right for where I like it to be, even without a wrist rest. Uh, yeah, that's fantastic. I missed one key in that. This has a really good sound. It is not quiet. It is not damped. This is the kind of keyboard that you're going to irritate every cubicle neighbor that you've ever met. Uh, and I love it for that. Pulling some of the keycaps, we can confirm they are using a metal back plate behind the keycaps. And so that does provide a good amount of stability and rigidity to the keyboard. Uh, the keycaps themselves are a standard Cherry MX style stem. So if you wanted to replace these keycaps with something else, you absolutely could. Although I do kind of like the uh, the ABS keycaps that came included. They, they feel nice. They've got a great texture on them. And uh, again, the translucency through the keys to, to illuminate the symbol, it looks fantastic. So probably the question some of you have is the same question that I had, and that is, why would you bother putting Hall Effect switches into a keyboard? First off, what is a Hall Effect switch and how does it differ from a tactile keyboard? Well, instead of connecting two pieces of metal together to initiate a contact on a switch as a traditional mechanical switch would, this is a Hall Effect switch, which is detecting the distance from a magnet source. It's become very popular with a lot of higher end joysticks, but it does have some fantastic implications when it comes to keyboards. Because there's no mechanical contact happening to actuate the key, you can actually define in software where you want the key press to actuate. So if I hold the function two button and then press number one, that will actually set the key press very, very light. So, oh wow, wow. So number one is 0.4 millimeter actuation distance. That is from the top of the stroke to 0.4 millimeters down. And I will say, it is all of that. Wow, that is sensitive. I've never used a keyboard that, that that's that sensitive before. That is insane. That is so sensitive. Brushing over a key actuates it. This is enough to actuate. Holy crap. Dude, that's insane. It got every key press there. It got every single one of them. That's literally just brushing my hand across the top of the keyboard. And in fact, I 
nicked F11 there on that one that made my browser go full screen. So on top of very shallow actuation, you can also define if you want the actuation further down. I usually like about a two mil actuation, so I'm assuming that's gonna be somewhere around six because you can set this anywhere from 0.4 to about 3.4 millimeter in total depth. Not bad. And actually, if I say, that's actually a little bit deep for me. So I'm wondering if more like a four would be the feel that I'm looking for. I'll say, I like it at three. Wow. Still a, a fairly shallow key press, but I'm probably at between a mil or maybe 1.2 mil. That's a really cool feature and really something that I hadn't thought about of having an infinitely variable keyboard when it comes to the depth of actuation. That's something you can't get with a mechanical switch because the, the way switches are designed is you're pushing one metal contact to make contact with another. Uh, with this, it doesn't matter because all you're detecting is the change in magnetic field. So as far as fit and finish, I am, I am fairly impressed. Uh, it is just an ABS enclosure, but it is very rigid. There's, like I said, pretty much no deck flex anywhere that I can detect in this keyboard. Um, the feel is awesome. The variability of being able to set your actuation point is fantastic. And I have purposely done no research on this going in because I didn't want to be either impressed or disappointed. So, uh, Rhett, can you reveal the price point? Right now it's listed on their website for $130. Okay. Okay. They say it's marked from 150. Okay. So they're definitely pushing into the the premium uh, big name keyboard manufacturers. Your your Corsair K70s and and things like that. Uh, there are a number of companies that produce mechanical keyboards somewhere in the $50 to $70 range. Uh, I am a huge fan of those. I, I love my Velocifiers and my Red Dragons just like anyone else does. But for primary keyboards, I do typically go a little higher end. I, I want something with a very repeatable and consistent key press across the entire range. I want something that is literally rock solid or in my case, billet aluminum. Feel wise, this is definitely above the, the $70 keyboard range. And if any keyboard enthusiasts are watching, you know that's a, an exponential scale once you get kind of beyond that point. This keyboard at $130 offers features that are just not available anywhere else because of that Hall Effect switch. Um, it's not as premium as something like a, a, again, a Corsair K70 Mark II. It, it's not quite as premium as some of those, you know, $150 and $200 keyboards. But because of this feature set and, and overall build quality, I'd say it's absolutely worth 130 bucks. <laughs> I kind of thought I was gonna die, but it's actually- That's pay, play pause. <laughs> <laughs> I pressed the button to mute and that started playing the last YouTube video, uh, which happens to be Alan Pan with some chainsaws strapped to his feet. <laughs> so hold on. <laughs> I kind of thought I was going to die, but it actually works. <laughs> that was a lot of I was like, no way did they put a soundboard into this and I'm just not aware of which sound effect I was on. Overall, I wasn't sure what I was going to think about this keyboard. Like I said, I, I'm definitely a huge fan of Hall Effect joysticks. I've done videos on replacing your Steam Deck controller with Hall Effect joysticks. Uh, I've remarked on the sensitivity of joysticks on both the uh, Aya Neo 2 and my upcoming uh, GPD Win Max 2 video reviews. Uh, it is something that should be started to be thought as standard because the technology is so much better than traditional joystick sensors. However, the implications when it comes to, to mechanical switches, I don't think can be understated because I thought I liked a deeper key press. I, I thought I was gonna be somewhere in the two mil range because that's where a lot of the keyboards that I use are at is between about 1.6 and two mil. 
I think this is less than a millimeter still at number three. I think it's probably like a 0.8. Uh, that tells me something that I wouldn't have known without researching a dozen different key, key switches. Uh, and actually, I'm a little impressed with how typable this keyboard is for someone who hates linear feels. So yeah, the Drunk Deer A75 Magnetic Switch Keyboard. Uh, links down in the video description. I, I'm genuinely impressed. I, I, I thought I was gonna go into this saying it's a gimmick, it's, it's half-baked. Uh, I expected something of a lower quality. This is not bad. Uh, build quality overall, like I said, it's definitely above something like a, a Velocifier, above something like a Red Dragon keyboard, and offers a feature set that just isn't seen really anywhere else. So if you're interested in a Drunk Deer M75, link down in the video description. And in fact, they gave me a 30% off coupon starting May 15th. So if you're interested in picking one of these up, uh, follow that link, use the, uh, the coupon code, get this for maybe less than a hundred bucks. So I think that's gonna wrap us up for today. Make sure to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. And on your way down to buy one of these keyboards, let me know if you think Hall Effect switches have a place when it comes to keyboards. Genuinely interested what your guys' thoughts are. Follow me on Mastodon for daily shenanigans like this, and be sure to check out the all new craftcomputing.store. Pick yourself up a rocks glass, some whiskey stones, or one of these sweet stone coasters. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. Today's beer is from Masthead Brewing in Cleveland, Ohio. It is the Jalapeno, sounds like it's Italian, uh, Jalapeno IPA, clocking in at 6.8%. There it goes. Come on, dang it. <laughs> this is gonna go well. There we go. And we're in. Where this never happens. <laughs> Well, while Rhett is figuring out how I can change the RGB effect, let's dive into this Jalapeno IPA. So beer for today, again, uh, Masthead Jalapeno IPA, 6.8%. This one is one that if you're not a fan of, of heat, not of spice, but if you're not a fan of heat, this is one that'll sneak up on you. Uh, it's a very slow burn. Uh, I feel that little bit of jalapeno heat all the way down here in my throat. And uh, it's just kind of sitting there. It's not really aggravating. It's not really, uh, you know, overly present, but I'm aware of it. And I feel the further down I get in this pint, the more present it's becoming. Uh, it's definitely not super hot, but it is enough to probably irritate someone who wouldn't order jalapenos on any food they ever ordered. So keep that in mind. The really fun thing is aroma-wise, taste-wise, this is just a pretty solid IPA. There's there's nothing offensive or, or really odd about it. And in fact, for a, a Midwest slash Ohio IPA, very thick, very rich mouthfeel. Not the most complex IPA I've ever had. It's uh, kind of a one trick pony with a top profile. Tastes like something like maybe an Amarillo hop. Uh, and uh, it hits very quickly, fades just as fast. A Little bit of, a, of an oily dry finish to it. And then maybe about 10 or 20 seconds later, you get this little twinge right about there that reminds you there's some jalapeno in there. I kind of like this one. 